I'm Roger Donaldson. I've been making this film now for two and a half years. And in that time, I've got to know Bert Munro pretty well, I think. I've found him to be a most extraordinary person. 53 years ago, Bert took his entire savings out of the bank and, to quote his brother, blew the whole lot on a 1920 Indian Scout motorcycle. Since that time, Bert devoted half his life to making the bike go faster. He takes his bike regularly to the Bonneville Salt Flats in the USA, where he holds many international speed records, including a world record. Bert's unorthodox approach to record breaking sounds like fantasy. He's reputed to have cast pistons in the sand, made cylinder liners out of cast iron sewerage pipes, carved by hand conrods out of old aircraft propellers and truck axles. The stories just go on and on and on. Bert, good luck now. I'm Dick Rosetta from the Salt Lake Tribune. Two? Dick Rosetta oh, from Dick the Salt Lake Tribune in Salt Lake City. Oh, the Tribune. That's right. I used to work for, with Arthur Rosetta, putting in milking machines in 1920. Is that right? <laughs> what are you, uh, what are you driving out here? Oh, uh, I've worked on this uh, sickle I bought new in 1920. How do you spell your last name? Is it B-E-R-T? B-U-R-T. B-U-R-T. Most of these Yanks call it. How's your last name spelled? M-U-N-R-O. M-U-N-R-O. Where do you hail from? Where's your hometown? Invercargill. How do you spell that? I-N-V-E-R-C-A-R-G-I-L-L. G-I-L-L. I generally spell it with one New L. New Zealand? Save ink. New Zealand. Yeah. It's the most southerly in the British Empire, actually. Bert, uh, do you ever quote your age, other than 39? It's no good me quoting. Everybody knows how old I am. I was born last century, <laughs> when Queen Victoria was the, the woman that counted. <laughs> At the time, are you trying to tell me that you still you still operate with the same chassis? Yeah, that's the original fr frame on my bike. Did you see it over there? Yeah, I've modified it a lot, and uh, I built a dozen wheels over. As wheels changed, I had kept up with technology, shall we say, and uh, and um, rebuilt. You, you've the made wheels. the wheels, huh? No, I just rebuilt them. Different. I just make the spokes and modify the hub and. Uh, use whatever uh, wheel rim is the latest design, you know. What, uh, how much power do you have now? What, uh... Oh, I, I haven't a clue. It varies from year to year. I work nine months and nine days every day ex uh, except uh, three hours off Christmas Day. And I had 27 test runs this year. 24 on the beach and, um, and three on the road illegally. <laughs> I was over the speed limit, you know. Yeah, as you said this well, morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give it a bit more time this afternoon. We might make 95. I'd say she's done that rod, though, bitch. Yeah, she's wrecked the uh, the piston or the rod. I think the rod might have broke. See, see she's had a huge. She's still got compression there. She must be touching the rod. No, that's just friction. <laughs> <laughs> Internal friction. Yeah, well, right, I'll let the show go on. Well, anybody can buy a bike and go fast nowadays, and... Uh, I think there's a lot more in it than uh, more enjoyable uh, developing a, a slow machine to go fast. In the 20s, when I first started racing, all the guys uh, practically uh, hotted up stock jobs. And uh, it was a battle, it wasn't only just riding, it was a battle of uh, uh, know-how and learning to make the bike go faster by experimentation and that. But anybody can buy a fast bike today and go fast. Uh, riding it is only one hundredth of the actual uh, uh, experience needed, I think, myself. Although there's, uh, uh, it can be pretty hairy at times too, you know, <laughs> especially in speed trials. Uh, I was running in a speed trial at Drummond two weeks ago, tomorrow, and uh, 
the bike was hitting undulations in the road so fast it kept striking my head and uh, finally blew to pieces and uh, I was blood all over as it poured out of my nose and cut on the face. I got heart shock in 1962. Uh, uh, when I got out of control at the uh, speed trials at Bonneville, at 150 miles an hour, uh, the bike was slamming over five foot at the top and two foot six from the salt and leaving a five inch wide mark. We measured it all up after, Howard Devaney and I, and uh, I got heart shock out of that, a delayed shock. It struck me two weeks later, and I went five miles like that and at 150 mile an hour, uh, I knew I was going to die because uh, uh, I decided to give it all I had and it went up to over 180 miles an hour, but it made no difference at all. It just kept slamming into a, a what you call a weave, you know, a violent weave. Why do you like going faster? Well, who doesn't? <laughs> Everybody breaks the speed limit. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> well, it, you, you work to get more out of your bike, and uh, the only way to really be sure it's going faster is to have it timed and tested. And there's something about uh, speed, it, it really uh, uh, shows the result of uh, work, whether good or bad, doesn't it? I, uh, I don't know why I like going fast. <laughs> well, when I was a kid, I rode horses and that to uh, on the farm, and every now and then you'd have them full gallop, which wasn't very fast, about 30 mile an hour, I guess. Why do you think it is that Bert has managed to make a bike that was originally designed to do 50 miles an hour do 200? Well, Bert, he, he's just a natural born, tenacious engineer. He has his theories, and he has the ability to put them into practice, and he has the ability to evaluate whether they're right or whether they're wrong family were quite small. I would say I would be about perhaps nine or ten at the time. And uh, father decides that if a car can pull a trailer, a motorbike can pull a trailer. So uh, he sets to and makes one. Uh, four children in our family, three girls and a boy. And uh, we used to go to Rivers and Rocks for our holidays, a small seaside resort near in Cable. And uh, Put the children in the trailer and away we set out to rivers and rocks. At that time the roads were mostly gravel and uh, we got going in this trailer anyway and the faster we went the more it wobbled and eventually all the children were spilled into the gravel. We were very sad and very upset about this. However we were bundled back into the trailer and away we went again and set off very slowly. While we went slowly it was all right. And, uh, of course, the faster we went, the way it went again started wobbling and we were spilled out again and all the children crying and <laughs> we bundled back into the trailer again and however, yeah, we got to Riverton eventually. I'm the oldest guy in the world to run uh, in record attempts and speed trials and I'm the oldest in the world to break records. I broke two New Zealand national beach records out here about 18 months ago. I think he's a, um, a remarkable old man. Um, he's probably one of the real individuals. He's, he's a person I, I envy who, because of his freedom, is um, one of the few free people. He does what he wants. And uh, I think motor most motorcyclists want to be individuals, but Bert, he's achieved something. In that a way. lot of people say to me, how do you keep going at your age? They must think I'm a bit over the uh, normal age for racing and, or record attempt or speed trials, whatever you happen to be in. And, um, well, I said, I always tell them I don't smoke. <laughs> Bert Monroe is my brother by adoption. I was the youngest of the second generation family. Uh, brought in by the Munros, and uh, he's always, of course, been crazy on motorbikes. And I well remember our mother saying that she really felt that Bert wanted to die with his boots on. There were times when he would be chasing a speed record where neighbours would report that they saw him flying in the air for quite a number of dozens of feet, and they were amazed that he could, in actual fact, survive. You can live more in five minutes uh, in a motorcycle 
in some of these events I've been in and some people do in a lifetime. You live more than five minutes. And... What do you think of Bert Monroe? Who, oh, old Bert? <laughs> well, he's a bit of a dag, you know, but <laughs> he's a trier, isn't he? <laughs> well, you don't meet very many characters in your life as you go along, but he would be one, the greatest, I would say, as far as we're concerned. Well, he's always glad to see you, that's one thing. You know, he never sort of, oh, I'm too busy, go on, go off, you know, sort of like other people are. And, oh, um, does get growly or anything if you're around. Well, I always figure um, a man's like a blade of grass. He grows up in the spring strong and healthy and green, and then he uh, reaches middle age and ripens, as it were. And then in the autumn, he's like a blade of grass. He just finishes, fades away, and he never comes back, just like a blade of grass. <laughs> Is that what you want to philosophy? <laughs> And I think when you're dead, you're dead. I've always thought that since I grew up a bit. I'm his grandson and very proud of it. Probably die on a motorbike. Every time he goes to America, he said that day, so I probably won't come back, but it doesn't worry. <laughs> he just loves it that much. I think that's, that's the way he would like to go, I think. <laughs> oh, I think he's a good guy. He's a wee bit past it for his uh, age, but uh, he goes pretty good, even even though of his age, for his ability on mechanicing, he's terrific. Right, you successfully said nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Reckon if I can be like him <laughs> when I'm his age, I'll be quite content. I know, it goes pretty fast, that's all I know. <laughs> I reckon he's a great guy. I've known him for, well, since I was a, left school, I suppose. And, uh, Yes, he's a real colourful personality. He always has been. One of the boys, enjoys a lot of fun, and he never seems to grow old. Bert Munro, oh, he's uh, you know, pretty good. He's just my kind of guy, you know. He's... Uh, what do you think of Bert Munro? <laughs> oh, God! Um, I think he's very... Um, he's clever. I also think he's a dirty old man. But he's nice with it, I will admit that. Um, not too bad. I just think he's clever. I've always been happy working on my bike. Even though it blows into hundreds of pieces, I just wade in again and start all over again. And uh, I'm happy doing that. And uh, uh, if you don't put in an effort at anything, well, you're, you might as well be a vegetable, mightn't you? Uh, it's effort and concentration that makes life worthwhile. And uh, nice ladies around is a big help. <laughs> <laughs> As the guy said at the party, uh, if there's no women, uh, there's no party for me. And he went away home again. <laughs> oh, he's, on the, when he was going overseas on the boat one time, he hit uh, a 19-year-old. <laughs> I'm not telling you that. I guess I am a fanatic or an enthusiast. I've been called a super enthusiast. Uh, working on my bike so many years, but, um, you know, over the years. But, uh, well, uh, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth finishing it if you can, isn't it? P uh, lots of people ask me, when are you going to give up? I say, I'm never going to give up till I get a good run. I thought next day uh, I'd best go and see his his mother, she was 84 at the time, so I knocked at the door and I said, just come in to give you a report in Bert. I says, he had a bit of an accident yesterday. And, uh, oh, she says, did he? I says, yes. Uh, uh, she says, serious? And, oh, no. I says, not actually. I says, a few pounds of meat gone. And she says, uh, I suppose it was on that blooming motorcycle. Uh, yes, I says, it was. Oh, she says, that foolish boy, she says, when will he ever give up those motorcycles? And she was 84 and Bert was 60. I've had eight concussions, one hemorrhage of the brain in crashes, uh, not counting the one off the bed when I was 11 months old. I was knocked clean out there. Then the next one I had was off a horse I had rounding up cattle one Sunday morning, and I was out all day. 
Then the next one was about 1921, standing on the seat of my bike, waiting for Uncle Alf to get his King Dick going and catch up on me. And I was sort of doing a few acrobatics on the seat, waiting for him, you know. And he said he saw me look round, and I don't know what happened, but I went right over, and he said, the way I landed on my head, he is sure my neck would be broken. I remember one time I was in Tappers when he was salesman for uh, Tappers and oh, Bert was a hired rider. Uh, every six weeks, new tires. And I was in there this one day and Alf Tappers says, what, new tires again, Monroe? Yes, Bert says, uh, I'm doing a lot of miles for you, Alf. He says, and I'm doing them fast. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Christchurch for 22 years and got the record, I think, three times, New Zealand record. And uh, in all those runs, I never had a perfect two-way run except three times. And three times, the timing failed, and that was the three times I made what I thought was a pretty good run. I said, never mind, Bert. Uh, next year we'll have a cable under the road and we'll have no more trouble. Well, do you know what happened next year? They couldn't get the road no more, and that forced me to go to America. This is Radio Salt Lake City, Utah, USA. The next song is for the speed freaks out at the Bonneville Salt Flats. This week, the world's fastest machinery gets it together on the salt to attempt to better the land speed record. The oldest competitor is 73-year-old Bert Munro, and he's coming 8,000 miles from New Zealand to run his 1920 Indian motorcycle, and Bert has owned the bike since it was new. Bert, we hope you join the 200-mile-an-hour club this year and better your existing world record. And if you're on the road heading for Bonnie, this next song's for you. Spring of 1920, I stayed a night at the Criterion Hotel in Invercargill. In the backyard, I saw the first Indian scout that come to these parts. Well, I just fell in love with that thing, and uh, so uh, it wasn't long before they come on the market, and I bought one of the first ones uh, for 140 pounds cash, acetylene light, and the electric models were 10 pound dear. Well, I just. Uh, I wasn't fussy about the electric light, so I bought the one with the uh, acetylene light, and that's it sitting on the trailer there right now. But uh, as the one writer in America said, the makers would never recognize this machine. <laughs> but uh, over the years, uh, I just rode it every day to work and every night to a dance. And one night my mother said, Bert, she said, couldn't you stay home just one night with mum and dad? Look, mum, I said, I'll stay home tonight. And for two years until I got married, I stayed home every Tuesday night. It happened to be a Tuesday night. Did I tell you about when I got arrested at Edwards Air Base? In 1959? Yeah. I'd bought a straight eight Pontiac and uh, went down to Mexico for a couple of thousand miles. Uh, and on the way, I hunted up where Edwards Air Base, you know. And um, at the time, I didn't know nobody was allowed in there without special written authority from the Defense Department in Washington, D.C. I headed in, and I used to cruise fairly rapidly on that straight eight Ponty. So I got away in there, uh, I saw a sign up, Welcome to Edwards Air Base. So I whooped her up and kept going. There's a lot more writing, too, you know. I got away in there and I got my camera out and I figured the X-15, see I want to see the X-15. It's the fastest plane that ever flew, a rocket plane, it has done over 4,000 miles an hour with a man on it. I looked up and here's a guy in a pickup. He got out and come over and he said, what do you think you're doing here? I said, I'm trying to load this goddamn camera. He said, I think you better come with me. I said, okay, I, I knew then I was in trouble. They took me in, they took my passport, my money, my wallet keys of my car, locked my car up, this, uh, and took me in, and the chief of security police was there, and there was a total of about eight men, and they were all standing handy, so I couldn't duck out the door if I wanted to, you know? So I went to this guy and that guy, and always somebody higher up. 
And I finally arrived at Lieutenant Colonel Terry Thomas's desk. He's, why did you want to see the X-15? See, that was the purpose of my visit. Well, I says, ever since I've been a kid, I've been interested in anything that rolls or goes, you know. I says, I remember ships at the bluff when I was three years of age and uh, railway trains and autos and motorcycles. He looked at me, he said, I've read about your motorcycle. I said, my motorcycle? He says, sure, in Popular Mechanics two years ago. And then he said, Monroe, he says, you know, he says, we think you're all right. Now, how would you like to see the X-15? By this time, I was in the clear, and that guy showed me every plane they had, including the first DC-8 under test. Some of them cost thousands of dollars. They get them built, you know. Whereas mine only costs uh, a few months of hard work. But I've been 23 years uh, working full time on uh, an Indian, and the fellow said, 23 years. And in 10 years here, I worked 16 hours a day for 10 years, including Christmas days and, and late. I never go anywhere on holidays because too many mugs on the road liable to kill you with an auto, you know. <laughs> When you sit up, you get a terrific sensation of speed. The whole country's rushing at you. You see, you're only a couple of feet above it with your eyes. Uh, that whole country rushes at you so fast, it's a blurred area close to the bike, but further out, it's clearer. I'm full bore, probably doing well over 180. She was just building up speed faster and faster and faster, and it was just going beautiful. It's never gone so good. I averaged uh, enough to, uh, as above the record, the existing record. Yeah, I got the American record with those two runs. Well, looks like Bert's gonna hold on to his own 1969 55-inch world speed record. 178.971. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Hooray! 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 Thank you. Many happy returns. On the way back from. Uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, he gets very ill. He slept in the rear seat of the Plymouth with the box under his knees, doubled up. He got very, very sick, and I mean sick. He finally goes to a hospital he sees on the edge of town, and he went in. He went in, and the doctors look at him and make a couple of tests just a minute. You come in here. Man, he says, you know, you're really sick. We're going to put you to bed. Bert says, what do you charge? 
fella says, $44 a day. Bert gets his jacket, puts it on, he says, I'll die in my car. And out the door he went. That's the last of the hospital I ever saw of Bert Monroe. And he's not died yet, you know, he's all right. I think if Bert had uh, access to, uh, if Bert had access to a modern metals, perhaps a few more modern machine tools, 30 years ago, I feel quite sure that the Japanese wouldn't be controlling the motorcycle industry today.